Uh, well, hello and welcome to um, the Scottish leg of this um, marathon um, news desk event in criminal justice. Uh, my name is Scott Grant and I'm a lecturer and researcher at the University of Dundee and I'll be chairing uh, what we hope to be quite an, an interesting discussion on uh, trauma-informed practice within criminal justice. I've got a, a wonderful panel of experts um, who are very keen to get stuck in to some discussion around this particular topic. Um, and before we do that, I wonder if I could just ask um, each of my guests to briefly introduce yourselves. Alex, maybe? Hi, thanks, uh, Scott. I'm delighted to be here. Um, hi, colleagues. My name's Alex Donnell. I'm a social work manager in Elite Justice Services in a relatively small local authority in Scotland. And I also have the privilege of serving as the designated Social Work Scotland representative in the National Trauma Training Steering Group. Thanks, Alex. Um, Becky, Jonathan, <laughs> anyone? Well, I go, hi. Yeah. I'm Becky, I'm also delighted to be here. I am a social worker within the Glen Isla project um, in Angus Council, and that's a gender specific project within criminal justice services working with female offenders. Okay, thanks Becky. And John? Hi everybody, I'm John Bradley. I'm a criminal justice uh, social worker and um, senior PRAC and I treatment manage the Moving Forward and Making Changes programme for clients convicted of sexual offences and also a programme for men and females who have been convicted of uh, intimate partner violence. I also have the, the luxury of being a senior PRAC working with cases uh, for predominantly men who have been convicted of violent offences. Right, thanks John. So hopefully the, the audience can see we've got a, a, a range of uh, uh, practitioners and managers and leaders in the field that uh, bring quite a lot of experience, do bring a lot of experience, there's no question about that, um, and have a lot of expertise in this particular area. So uh, this is the ideal panel to have a discussion like this on a live uh, topic in practice. Uh, but, but just very quickly, just to put things in context for our international viewers, um, Criminal justice social work, or it's kind of more commonly known as justice social work in Scotland, is pretty much the same as probation services that you'll find elsewhere in the UK and also across Europe. Um, so essentially the work that, 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 that are done by practitioners is with people that are made subject to community sanctions and measures on the most part. Um, and that's just to set a little bit of context in relation to the type of work that's done and the services of group um, that's that's involved in that, or that is the focus of that. Um, but just to um, set the context a wee bit further, what, what I would like to do is, is just start off with some quite interesting points that came from a 2019 survey um, in Scotland, and this is the 2019 um, Scottish Health Survey, which is a population level survey in Scotland, um, where for the first time, um, the survey itself started in 2008, it's an annual survey, and in 2019 for the first time they included questions on um, adverse childhood experiences or adults that have had an adverse childhood experience um, in their childhood, obviously. Now, what was really interesting about that was it's 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 a major study. It's um po it's a population level study. Um, it got a huge team of people involved in it, and it's led by the Scottish government and a range of different academics and practitioners in the field. Um, and they interviewed four thousand nine hundred and three um adults, and what they found was that just over one in seven adults in Scotland reported four or or having four or more adverse childhood experiences um, and verbal abuse was the most common ACE reported and uh, just and that was just under uh, half of adults reported that and that was followed by uh, physical abuse at 28%, household domestic violence at 24%, parental separation at 23%, then it goes on to household mental illness, household alcohol abuse, sexual abuse household drug abuse, incarceration of a household member. Um, and so it, it just seems as though it's uh, something that this, what well, this survey identified as something that's quite prevalent within um, the Scottish population. And the conclusion from the report states that 
substantial proportions of the Scottish adult population have suffered from some form of abuse, neglect or other adverse experiences during their childhood, with 71% reporting having experienced at least one ACE, so at least one adverse childhood experience, and 15% experiencing four or more ACEs. Now, the, the, the thing about the survey is, is that it, the, I had to be look at the methods of it and it's quite rigorous and that could be um, scaled up to population level. So it's quite, so the findings are, I suppose, in many ways quite significant. And what the Scottish Government have said on it is, um, and uh, I'll shut up in a minute, but what the Scottish Government have said on it is, uh, we are committed to ensuring that Scotland has a workforce that's fully aware of the impact of trauma and is equipped to respond appropriately to people who have experienced trauma at any age. Um, so I wonder if this is um, probably a good point to bring Alex in um, and just with your experience and uh, and being aware of things at a policy level in terms of what's happening, um, would, would you be able to kind of sketch out for us how we've kind of got here um, and what trauma-informed practice is and why it's really gathered pace in Scotland because it's certainly something that's, that's definitely come on the agenda and it's definitely something that um, that the Scottish government are taking seriously and that are recognising. Yes, oh, thanks, Scott, and and thanks for kind of setting the scene there. Um, and certainly, you know, the prevalence and uh, identification of prevalence of trauma uh, within the population that we serve in criminal justice um, ha has been uh, extremely noticeable. Mm -hmm. I'll start with the first thing about you know trauma informed practice because there's so many of these here trauma-sensitive practice, trauma-informed care, uh, and there's so many terms going about. But ostensibly, you know, thinking about trauma-informed practice, um, it's a strength-based framework, and it's grounded in an understanding of exactly what you were saying, the prevalence uh, of trauma in the population that presents to criminal justice and the responsiveness to the impact of that trauma. You know, this approach emphasises the kind of physical, psychological and the emotional safety for everyone. And this is really important because this includes practitioners as well, because it's important their well-being within the delivery of services. And ultimately, that this framework, which is trauma-informed practice, you know, creates opportunities for survivors. Some people talk about people who are survivors or people with a history of adversity and trauma to rebuild control and you know be empowered and safe within their lives it's really important you know when we think about justice mm. you know this journey towards becoming a trauma informed nation as you set out that as the vision of the uh, the group that i sit on is probably going to take us by considering the tra traditional models and justice that have been uh, observable over the last kind of maybe 10 20 years which may have been quite risk and, and punitive mm -hmm. in their delivery. And, and I'll say that because, you know, we still know today that Scotland has the highest prison population per head in West, Western Europe. Mm -hmm. And that we're needing to think about, you know, reevaluating our policies, our practices, and parts of the, all parts of the justice system um, and this reconceptualization. And we begin to reframe behaviors as coping mechanisms and survival strategies, which are arguably related to unresolved trauma, mm -hmm. but cause a collision within the justice system, sometimes harming themselves and harming other people. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of sets out in relation to Scotland, you know, it's been so encouraging to see the commitment of this practice thriving across the nation, Scott. Um, in relation to justice, we're, we've just trained 750 criminal justice uh, social workers across Scotland, which is 42% of the population. Um, and the momentum and activism is down to many, many people. And it would be uh, important that I acknowledge the voice of survivors within that change process. And in 2016, you know, we've seen the NHS um, they were tasked by the Scottish Government to lead and promote an independent trauma-informed practice within Scotland that you referred to. I think one of the things I would say, you know, I'll kind of finish on this, is that mm -hmm. trauma is a public health crisis. I, I would say that. 
And there's a stream of research studies. And as somebody who's, you know, wedded to, to criminal justice practice that show the unresolved trauma people present as a greater risk of experiencing distress, mm -hmm. difficulties in education, mental health, violence, drug addiction, poor health, uh, regrettably suicide. Mm -hmm. So for me, the justice setting uh, treats a population where there's high levels of adversity and that uh, by adopting a trauma-informed approach to support healing and well-being mm -hmm. is ultimately how we're going to reduce risk and build safer communities, mm -hmm. communities with better resilience. So for me, it sits very nicely uh, with our approach to criminal justice and trying to support recovery of the people that we serve. Mm -hmm. You know, that, 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 that's really interesting and we do get a sense that um, the agencies are certainly moving this forward. The Scottish Government is certainly moving this forward. And even from a Mon point of view, as being an ex, an ex criminal justice social worker, um, and again, just for our kind of international viewers, the, the, the kind of work that we that I did and that you do um, we, we brings us into contact with people who, and, and I, I don't know if, if actually if, if audiences appreciate just how much information we get about people's lives how much intimate information we get about how, how people were brought up and all the connections within families, et cetera, et cetera. And we get a real sense of uh, just the amount of stuff that's happened to the people that we work with. And some of it is quite breathtaking that a person could have gone through all of that and actually still be here existing. Um, and that always really surprised me as a, a criminal justice social worker interviewing somebody for the first time and gathering information about their lives. Um, and I was always just stunned by how people could just cope, just generally cope with day-to-day -day life. Um, so uh, I suppose, I mean, that, 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 that's my past experience. I suppose it'd be good to get contemporary experience now from uh, our practitioners that we've got on the panel. Um, so I wonder if I could turn to Becky and John now um, and just ask that, that, that you're obviously at the front line and you're having to translate policy into practice. Uh, and I'm just wondering how you do that in your work and what you think that, and, and what difference has that made? What difference has this approach made, I suppose, to your practice? And I'm just wondering if you could give us some examples, if, if, that's, if that's okay. Okay. John, do you want to? John? After I'm, you, Becky, if you want to kick off. Oh, no uh, thing here. <laughs> I, know, I, I, suppose for, I suppose for me, um, we are a gender specific service and that means that we are female only workers as well. Um, I think that's a massive thing for even getting women within the criminal justice system over the door. Um, the fact that we, we promote that we're women supporting women. Um, ultimately, that's the bottom line. And I think that's just about understanding that as a woman, I appreciate women's needs, that it's not just, there's risk factors there, but actually for, for women within the criminal justice system, the risk element's often much lower, mm -hmm. um, and it's their needs that are much higher, and that then relates to the offending or transpires into substance misuse, poor mental health, um, and, and domestically violent relationships. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I suppose for me, it's, it's having that understanding and if we, we have that, we're, we we're automatically should fall into creating safe spaces. You know, they should come into an environment where they don't feel inferior, that they're empowered, that we're that, that they're safe. You know, the, the massive thing for me is I've noticed over the four years that I've worked with the Glen Isla project that we've we've got a much more homely environment. We've moved into hubs so that women aren't having to travel across Angus. We are going to them. We've got hubs in three different local communities now. Mm -hmm. um, and the difference that's made to engagement and the difference that's made to relationship building, it, it's just phenomenal, do you know? Down to basic things like we've got rid of strip lights. Do you know, the, the, they're traumatising for women. A lot of women, I find that, that light sensitive. I think it's massive across people with trauma. I mean, be able to dim the lights and sit with a blanket and have a cup of tea, it's just, it's warm and it's inviting and you see them glowing, the fact that they're safe here and you know, we've not got a closed door, we're not appointment only, women can chat that door, come in and if they need to sit and have a cup of tea and chat or not chat, then then that's totally fine. 
Um, and I think that's a good starting point for, for a lot of places that are still to, to begin implementing that trauma-informed approach is that the environment is absolutely massive for people that we are working with. Um, do you know, I've took women to mental health appointments and we've not got past the door because it's that clinical setting. So we need to get to the point that workers are coming to women. Do you know, someplace that they're, they're safe. And this is the same with men. Um, I'll refer to women because that's who I work with. <laughs> um, but it's the same. It's, this should be the same across the service. It needs to be consistent. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks, Beck. Sorry, John. I would I would totally agree with Beg. I think the environment's uh, so important that what we know is you know trauma is often embedded in the body. So this this kind of heightened tuneness and it it can be triggered at any point by senses, by smells, by sounds. And I think in social work we're so used to maybe just accepting that this is the environment that we're given as social workers. Council buildings is often the saying. Um, and I remember when I moved to my current authority, I was kind of. A, been working in a former Victorian poor house. It was a beautiful building, but steeped, steeped in history, but very institutional. Coming to my pleasant and uh, in for this environment, I was kind of pleasantly surprised that it was different. But I think within time, it, I noticed the clients were saying it just reminded them of almost like a police interview rooms. Uh, Saracen Street Police Station in Glasgow was often referenced to me as the, the sound insulation, we could hear clients speak in other rooms. So one of the things that we, we looked was about how can we make this a safe place for clients and uh, clients were sent central to that. So we really took involved the, the, the views of clients. We set up a, a, a service user group for clients so they can really look at that environment. And as Becky was saying, you know, we have built an environment around what clients actually are looking for and they're looking for a place where they feel safe where they feel that they can come in and they can actually start building on that relationship. We don't get it right all the time. Um, well, what we thought we were getting right, Scott, was we dropped the word criminal from, from the sign. And I remember a client coming and storming in and he had just got out of custody and he was shouting and swearing at me because he had never visited our building before, but he couldn't find the building because he was so used to the word criminal that he was actively looking for it. Um, and once we, we worked with him and he actually got allocated to me over time. And I think what was important to him is his narrative was changing. He had had a child. He was working towards his future. He was having hope. But every time he came down to the estate where our building was located, he was having reminders of the difficulties in his life. For example, the building across the road was where he went to child protection core group meetings as a kid. He had his lack reviews and he went to the youth intensive support in the other building. So what we did with that, we were saying, well, we can't actually change those buildings, but what we can do is we can change the narrative around the building that you're working in. And we involved him in that environment. And for him to then report back to saying, well, you've taken on board what I've said, you've changed the color schemes, you put the sound insulation in, you've chosen the, for me, that's been quite powerful. And what we are, our service user groups reporting back now and what my colleagues are reporting back is that clients are now seeing them feeling a lot more safer in the environment. Um, dropping the word criminal for me has been that was one of the highlights. It, it cost £75 to change the sign. Um, but for me, that's been something that I'd wanted to do for over five years previously working in other settings as well. And um, because the word, as you know, language sticks and it can serve to reinforce trauma and st stigma. So dropping the criminal has been one of the highlights in moving forward. And um, I, as I said, as Becky was saying, looking at how we actually now move this forward to the next stage of the environment as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, have you both seen from the front line then differences just in terms of uh, even things like levels of engagement, has that, has that, has it improved levels of engagement, do you think? Yeah. For yeah, I, I would say so. I, I think it's very apparent um, within the community who is really driving that trauma-informed practice and what which services aren't. And I think that it would be interesting to see the levels of engagement in different services, those that are more proactive. Because um, I, I personally find, John, definitely that, that you give that environment, you give that trust, then you, you get it back. You know, that's when things start building. I don't put pressure on we're doing this specific offence focused work because that, that's not what they need at that time. You know, they've just came through the criminal justice system, court for a lot of women's traumatising in itself. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I personally think it, it makes a massive difference to the levels yeah. of engagement. I, I, I would agree uh, with Becky. I, th I think it's not just the environment, it's about how we 
what we're very good at as social work is operating within a risk lens. We build a whole raft of procedures around that. Um, when we we work with risky clients or the kind of clients I think are the, you see yourself on the front page of the Sun newspaper and it's the kind of career killing uh, clients, the ones which are very, very risky, you naturally lean in to those uh, kind of uh, authoritarian risk processes. Um, well, what a trauma-informed perspective takes is rather than pathologizing someone and starting out with a kind of standpoint of what's wrong with someone, you start off with a standpoint of, you know, what has happened to someone. Um, we look at actually what I've noticed as a trainer is our capacity to form relationships with people. We're really good at that in social work, but it's not just about relationships. It's about supporting clients to have a self-awareness of the, the impact that trauma is having on their body. Because if you can develop that self-awareness first and foremost, you're kind of reorientating someone's um, the limbic system back to that kind of prefrontal cortex. You're aiding the decision making. You're supporting the person's capacity to, to be aware of how they're feeling when they're coming into environment, get them within the window of tolerance, and then, you're be, they're, then they're more readily um, you can then then start looking at interventions moving forward. But I think to start from a position of saying, let's start from risk, let's hit them with interventions, that actually, that's not going to do someone with a significant history of trauma any favours at all. No. I think as well, if, you know, if we take that assumption as criminal justice social workers, that the people walking through our door have ACEs, have had trauma, if we have that assumption, our empathy should be natural. Do you know, we say in social work, it's a, uh, empathy is massive. Mm. But you, you can get caught up in looking at the risk assessments, looking at, you know, the, the offence. Some people, like you say, it's in the front of the papers, it's on the court rolls, it can be made very public. And just instead of uh, focusing on that, when they walk through the door, we say, you know, that must have been tough. Yeah. You know, I, I know things have been hard. Just having that personal level of understanding is so, so important. You know, they, they've been through the justice system. We've got them on the order and we're not there then to judge from from that point. Yeah, I, th I think that's a, I think that's great. If I can just jump in very quickly, you know, it makes me think about empathy and compassion Scott, which hasn't mm -hmm. featured a lot and within social work practice, you know, talking about compassion, but again, it's coming uh, in through trauma-informed practice. Mm -hmm. And the point that you started off with talking about children who have got layered adversity, so growing up in poverty, mm -hmm. where there's sexual abuse, physical abuse, you know, uh, community strains and violence, you know, um, and going th as a child going through the education system, the high level of welfare and support into the youth system. But once that child then becomes an adult and into the criminal justice system, and there's a really important point here, that our observations across Scotland is that there is a gender sensitivity and women's services have moved, like Becky's service, and I've worked with Becky and her team, have moved at a greater pace I, I'm potentially due to Ely Shangelini and the reports, but we forgot about the men because once the men who were impoverished, sexually abused, battered with their father, then become adults and they're expressing violence, emotional dysregulation and causing harm, we've, we've, we've got a narrative that all of a sudden you're making really bad choices, you know, I, I, and we've got this lens and we're trying to reimagine this back into hold on a second, these are manifestations of somebody who is really wounded, who's carrying a history of trauma, like John was saying uh, as well. And I think that we're now trying to say it's important uh, within this gender sensitivity, and it brings in male masculinity, that we reach out and that we support the men who are ultimately one of the, the, they're the highest numbers within our justice population. Too. So I think we've got a lot to learn from services like Becky and people who have been driving forward in women-specific services. Mm -hmm. I think what's really interesting for me is that a lot of these um, uh, changes that can be made are cheap things to do. And I mean cheap as in terms of just budgets and what's available for local authorities um, in terms of enhancing services. And um, I suppose... Uh, Alex, from, from, from your point of view as being a leader in the field and being able to see things from uh, top down, do you see that, that gain in traction 
amongst other local authorities or, or within the professional yeah. at that level. Absolutely. And and again, it's back to I'm so glad that it's caught such a momentum within Scotland. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have the benefits of working within the Community Justice Partnership. Mm-hmm. So I'm having discussions daily. I was having a discussion with a police officer the other day who was talking because remember, trauma-informed practice looks different through each organisation. And yeah. also the principles of collaboration, trust and choice will be different because we're statutory services. So we have to promote choice within a statutory setting. And I had a police officer telling me all about the consideration of the environment, that first and foremost, not to bring a person into handcuffs, because anybody with a history of trauma, that's going to be re-traumatizing and a loss of control. And we see many, many times whereby women within uh, services of justice and men uh, are unable to cope within that setting. So his awareness and cognizance of that. And then he went on to talk about the actual environment at the very last line, should you have to detain somebody and starting to think about what would you give somebody within that environment to try and regulate and calm. They were talking about chalkboards. They were talking about, you know, reading material. They were talking about a, a number of different mechanisms. And I just was so encouraged when I start to hear a police perspective mm-hmm. and consideration. And and as you say, some of it's very basic. He says, you know, we're putting together packs for, for women. If we had to detain them with, you know, scented soaps, we're thinking about, you know, providing toothbrushes and dental in the morning and trying to really inject humanity into that process. Mm-hmm. And as you said, Scott, actually that injecting humanity and compassion into a process uh, isn't going to cost a lot of money. Uh, and, and people have said to me in justice, it's like, well, one, I remember one person that we were delivering the training and they said to me, this is uh, enabling me to be the practitioner I always wanted to be. And mm-hmm. I thought that was a, a very powerful statement. It also lets us think, you know, where we've been. So, yes, I'm, I'm seeing it across all. I could give you examples in all areas of the service mm-hmm. uh, and key stakeholders. And I'm seeing a real big movement. I think the movement in, in justice is an increase in confidence, Scott, because mm-hmm. dealing with trauma, we've done two evaluations, can still be frightening. I don't mm-hmm. know how many times people have said, what about opening the can of worms? That comes up regularly. So appropriate training to be able to engage with somebody with a history of trauma. And as John was saying, you know, supporting good emotional regulation, which you see as a risk factor in so many the the, the crimes that bring people mm-hmm. into the collision with justice. Mm-hmm. Um, and also uh, supporting the staff, whether it's police, whether it's social worker, whether it's health, thinking about vicarious trauma and the mm-hmm. impact, because this approach says that you can't pour for an empty cup. And mm-hmm. the principles of trauma-informed practice mean that I have to feel quite empowered in my organisation as a, as a practitioner. Mm-hmm. I have to feel as if I feel safe within this setting, if I'm going to try and increase the safety of another person. Mm-hmm. And, and these are equally important. So, yes, starting to see a, a huge uh, change. And um, as I said, I'm delighted to, to continue mm-hmm. that work um, across Scotland just now. Mm-hmm. Well, great. You, you, you've kind of answered my question because I was going to ask, um, I mean, um, critics would suggest or say that, well, I mean, social workers are not trained to deal with uh, trauma um, in, in a formal education and that uh, a trauma-informed approach is, is effectively what social workers have, have been doing for years, but it's not been framed or labelled in a particular way. Um, I mean, I'm putting that out there as a, as a controversial point and it'd be interesting to to get your responses to that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a, a great point. So sometimes people say, so I'm not a therapist, Alex, and social workers have a lot of work on. It's not like we're needing to say, you know, I'm going to take on and, and it's about working together. So there's one thing we know first and foremost is that the best recovery for somebody with a history of trauma is to increase and wrap around the capacity of the community mm-hmm. and that that creates wellness. What I often say, and, and it's a bit cliched, is that, you know, we don't need to be a therapist to be therapeutic. Mm-hmm. And 
the the focus that we take in Scotland is that we are supporting uh, safety and stabilisation, Scott. Mm-hmm. That's a really important that that's that's a language that comes from you know the trauma informed literature, mm-hmm. but it's a language that's inherent in us in social work, which is saying is I'm going to focus on relational based practice. Mm-hmm. I'm going to focus upon creating safety and trying to. Uh, get a wraparound range of services that increase your connection because trauma is an illness of isolation and that I'm going to support recovery and well-being. Mm-hmm. And, and if, so in some ways, it is very, very similar to what we do. And we're not asking people to say that, you know, if somebody experiences a history of childhood adversity, say, you know, they were um, sexually abused in childhood, It's been able to respond to that appropriately without re-traumatising, but it's not our role, nor would it be the the best practice to think that you would try and process that abuse. So there's a lot of learning. What is it we're actually asked, being asked to do? And when I explain that to social work practitioners, they say, no, that that really sits with what I would be aiming to do. Mm -hmm. Because as we know, and this is one of my concerns, and John touched upon it, is if we don't create that safety and stabilisation, if we then go on to to rush into processes of, you know, cognitive behavioural interventions and a number of other kind of process-driven areas that are mainly cognitive-based, the likelihood of them being successful, and there's a brilliant evidence base for those modalities and their injustice, but if we don't get those building blocks right, then the likelihood of them being effective is is hugely reduced. Um, So I think it is welcomed. I think it sits nicely uh, with social work practice. And I think it reimagines a lot of the things that we hold extremely dear to our profession. Oh, good. And uh, I suppose, John and Becky, do do you see that from from your practice that um, that ensuring that those building blocks are put in place, does that have more of a kind of... um, positive effect on um, maybe more kind of, um, maybe not cognitive behavioural work, but, but more kind of um, structured work that you might do with somebody later on. And um, Does that seem to have a better effect if that relationship and that those building blocks are in place? I, yeah, I think I think so. Um, in terms of my, when I previously started off doing group work with men convicted of sexual harmful behaviour, what we would start with would be writing up on a flip chart, their offence account, underlining the bits of the offence account where they went wrong and basically kind of almost gave them a telling off and told them how they could do better and pointing out where they went wrong in their in, in their life. We're now moving to a position of the Moving Forward and Making Changes programme, which has been around for six years, which actually starts off at a point of safety and stabilisation, uh, increasing guys' self-awareness, because what we do know now, that, and my experience tells me, if we increase their self-awareness of not necessarily of the impact of trauma on their body and how it impacts on the way they manage themselves, we can increase their capacity uh, to self-manage when they go into the room. Uh, we can break down the kind of barriers that those kind of protective part, things that they've put in place to protect themselves from being hurt again in terms of relationships by treating them as, as human beings, building trust, that increases their capacity to form relationships so that when we actually do intervention work, they're more responsive to it. Uh, and also, yeah, we're not necessarily therapists and certainly we're not psychologists, but when we are recognising that trauma has taken part in someone's life, that if we can build capacity for them to make use and form relationships with others, they're more readily acceptable and willing to, to go and work with the professionals that we bring in to, to support them to, to address trauma in their life. So that, that's certainly my experience. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I would just reiterate, reiterate that, John. You know, by the time you, you're looking at doing that work, you should have a, a really strong relationship with, with your service users. And that massive part of that for them is trust. Some some service users and women I work with have never trusted an adult. They've never been able to trust an adult because they've been traumatised, they've been re-traumatised. That goes from sexual abuse in childhood to then leading to domestic violence in adulthood, mm-hmm. um, and and you're that only person that they've had that that trust with, and if you get to the point where you're saying to them, I think this would be good for you, do you know, I I'll come with you and we'll sit and we'll do it together, and if afterwards we need to 
to send you home with a bag of like you know bubble bath and candles and just chill out and I'll see you in a week if you need a week to process that that's okay but once you have got that relationship it's much it's much more accessible do you know other services are more accessible getting a woman in and telling her what her case management plan is that involves mental health substance misuse it doesn't work they need to be empowered you know they need to be part of their own plan and for me if that case management plan for the first three months is we're going to meet up weekly we're going to go on a walk and we're going to walk and talk then that's what it is Mm -hmm. do you know there's there's no there's no pressure there um I think that needs to that needs to come before the the process things some of the time, and we shouldn't be scared of social workers to challenge that. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I, and c- can I just just say that in many cases, Scott, and it's important mm-hmm. to get that. So there's two things: many cases, people who experience trauma, and the most important buffer for well-being and overcoming trauma is a safe, secure relationship with somebody who's emotionally available. That's everybody. Because, you know, that includes all us with the death of a loved one, having a car crash. So most people will overcome that. Our population is highly vulnerable given poverty, social deprivation and all the factors that we're talking about. And the intervention that Becky described there about, you know, being able to access, you know, music, um, art classes, drumming classes, walking, outdoor walking, and that supportive relationship for a huge population will enable the recovery from trauma. Mm -hmm. And then from a small population, a very small amount would require very specific psychotherapeutic modalities. That is a small amount. And it's once that Becky's been working for 18 months, 24 months, and that that person may have overcome that. And if not, it's saying, okay, we can take a final step and that takes us in and it's really important. So social work and many times I would say we're going to be meeting and connecting with somebody for two years. That's a great opportunity to mm-hmm. walk together and to grow together and that many people will find that sufficient. Right. Okay. Do, John, are you going to say something there? I, I was just going to say, I, I love the, the part that Becky said about going out and taking people, going for walks with clients, because the reality is we've got so used to, especially in yeah. justice settings, that this idea that we have to, to to take clients and we have to sit down in a room with them and, and do safety plans and talk, and they're very important, but there's parts that I used to work in uh, with adolescents in residential settings and I'm always left thinking why can't we apply some of the things that we did in residential settings with adolescents to actual adult settings. So one of the things that we myself and uh, we've, and my colleagues have been introducing in, in, in our office is actually going out and doing some of the intervention work as we walk, as we talk. We're quite fortunate that we we can access quite a lot of rural settings around where, where I'm located. So we, we take clients out with us uh, and the clients report back. There's that idea about your, your blending exercise with actual intervention work, with being out in the outdoors as well. And clients will report back uh, that, that they found that out a lot more meaningful of an experience than sitting down with a worker in a room, going over a keep safe plan, talking about intervention. Mm-hmm. Oh, good. I mean, I thought, I, I, I think for me, I think it's great to hear that, <clears throat> that that we seem to be moving away from this really strict risk paradigm, which dominated justice for quite a long mm-hmm. time, uh, and we're moving into more of a kind of creative mm-hmm. landscape. I think, which is um, um, as an ex criminal justice social worker, I wish I had back back then. Um, and um, so, so it's, it's it's fantastic to hear that that's the uh, occurring at the front line, which is great. Um, we've got um, not a lot of time left, folks, so I wonder if I could just ask just a, a kind of final question about, um, just for our international viewers, if there's any kind of advice you'd give them if they're thinking about maybe adopting this or thinking about a trauma-informed approach in their um, jurisdictions, is there a, any final points you'd like to make on that or any advice? Uh, Scott, I would say very quickly, and it's in relation to maybe, you know, policy say makers and you'd answer this question differently that you know the acknowledgement as you say about the prevalence of trauma um, and that we're dealing with a public health crisis and that ultimately you know the re-traumatization if you look at the prison population estate you know we are 
uh, the effectiveness that and the cost is absolutely billions and, and is arguably saying that you know we, we lock up and incarcerate people with histories of trauma and that we know that you will never punish a population into being well. I'm not saying that a small minority do need to be uh, you know incarcerated or for the, for the public's protection and that really adopting this uh, could change the landscape but it would be a much more cost effective um focus on, on building you know kind of wellness within communities uh, and within society and ultimately if you think about justice these are the mums and dads of the children so if we're able to adopt this we break the cycle and that's what when i'm talking to all policymakers i have to talk about it costs billions you know, to look at the punitive aspects and if we're trying to break this cycle so that the children then grow up feeling attuned, safe, well, then we start to increase the wellness of the population and that would have a, a huge impact uh, in seeing less, you know, things like drug-related deaths, incarceration, overdose, suicide. So that's some of the points I would want to... And, and the final point I would say is ask the survivors. If you're starting this... Go and ask the people who have a history of trauma. They are the experts and they will tell you um, where to start and how to progress. Right, thanks, Alex. Um, John and Becky, any, any final final points of advice you give? I, th I think, like, obviously, like Alex says, it's got to, you've got to have support of leaders. You know, those above you need to be on board. Um, and I, I come myself very lucky, you know, we as staff within my team have anti-vicarious trauma plans to, to process our own traumas and own triggers and be aware of that because we know that burnout in social work is absolutely massive. But in terms of as a practitioner, you know, I've just took on the kind of role of, of women consultation. So asking your service users what they want, what would benefit them, what wouldn't. You know, you'll find across your service there's triggers that are very common, you know, whether that be, like you say, light and whether that be people saying, I just want the window open. And it comes to building, some of the windows don't open, you know, mm -hmm. basic things. So, yeah. So do you want us to go outside? Do you want group work? Do you, is that, is that unhelpful? Mm -hmm. um, and that's a massive thing. What I'm doing just now is, you know, when surveys and things are coming out that typically staff well, engaging, getting getting your service users to engage with them, asking them what's been barriers in the past, and mm -hmm. um, what do you need, and you know, just it's just having that transparency, I think, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. within your service and kind of breaking down that hierarchy of you're a criminal, I'm your social worker, and this is what's going to look like. Yeah, mm -hmm. and as. As Alex said, seeing the um, our service users as experts in their own lives and experts that can oh, tell us a lot about um, the changes that could be made to services. Um, you, John, sorry, did you have something? I think just to echo what Alex and Becky have said, you know, I think we, one of the things that I've been looking at recently is the work of Dr. Karen Friesman's about creating trauma-informed organisations. I would recommend that any org, any people are looking at creating an or a trauma informed culture really looks and draws on the work of the likes of Dr. Karen Friesen because that'll take you through a self assessment. It'll take you through working with very closely, collaboratively with clients because they are the experts. Importantly, it's also about getting staff on board. Any change process, you've got to bring staff on board as well to say why this is why we're doing it. What, what would your understanding of service look like and how also can we support you? I think if we're going to risk Risk assessments are going to be part of the course for justice settings for years to come. I think it's also then looking at actually, if we're going to look at risk, let's also look at protective factors. There's tools out there that we can actually home in and enhance our understanding of protective factors like the Sandprof <coughs> risk assessment tool. If we're also going to look at the work that we do with clients, let's look at Good Lives, the work of Tony Ward. Good Lives is a way of actually looking, supporting clients to go through a self-reflective assessment about actually what is their goals are their life what are they good at what are their strengths and that allows us to look holistically importantly we also need to bring services on board as well and as alex has touched upon uh, working with the police working with health as well so that all services are aware of what trauma-informed service looks like yeah no that, that that's good and again uh, it sounds as though that's <clears throat> that's certainly what the scottish government are pushing for in terms of um, a trauma-informed workforce, um, not just social work, but other, um, certainly other professions and other um, key partners and key stakeholders in the field. Um, 
Okay, folks, um, it just leaves me to thank um, my guests, Alex, John and Becky. Thank you very much for giving up your time today. Really appreciate it. And to our international viewers, uh, I would just say that I hope the discussion has given you um, some insight into current practice in Scotland. Uh, we do wish we had more time because we could take this down a whole range of different avenues, which would be um, really interesting. Uh, but many thanks to you for, for watching and listening. And, um, and that's goodbye from Scotland. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.